<laughs> anyway, thank you, Daniel. Uh, and, and thank you and the entire organizing committee for the conference that you put together. Uh, thanks to... <laughs> thanks to CLAGS as an organization, it is a real treasure. Uh, and thank you to the many presenters. I've gone, gone to a lot of sessions, both plenary sessions and the uh, individual sessions over the last two and a half days, and it's been so rich. It's really been a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, so, um, well, let, let me start by saying that when Daniel contacted me last November about doing a keynote at the conference, I had no hesitation about immediately saying yes, right? Uh, you know, what Harry had done, uh, the vision he had in founding the Mattachine Society was obviously worth talking about. Uh, and uh, for myself, it had been so important for me to interview Hay back in the 1970s and then to have the privilege to try to reconstruct the experience of him and the others in founding the Mattachine Society. So, you know, of course, I was going to say yes to an opportunity not only to celebrate Hay, but also to reflect a generation later on history and change, uh, how we make meaning out of the past, the kinds of things we do together in order to keep that history alive. Great. Well, I miscalculated. Because if the truth be told, for most of these last 10 months, every time I have made an attempt to prepare this talk, it has been as if a radioactive shield was preventing me from getting anywhere near the task. Uh, I've experienced, a, really, a deep sense of dread uh, as if it would be even painful to engage the subject matter and reflect on it. Uh, thinking about Hay and the Mattachine Society from this distance in time, uh, with an additional generation of lived experience, of organizational activism, and of history writing, has provoked, I must admit, not joy, uh, but waves of skepticism, of uncertainty, of doubt, of self-criticism, and a whole host of other feelings as well. And so finally, in September, as the time to be here got closer and closer, uh, and the talk was not yet done, I finally decided to pay attention to that reaction and try to turn it to my and I hope yours, but I can't be sure of that, uh, turn it to my advantage by constructing a talk that seeks to understand why it is that an encounter in the 1970s with a historical figure like Hay could have been so profoundly important and inspirational then, while the prospect of reconsidering his legacy now, more than a generation later, could be so deeply unsettling for me. So first what I'd like to do is to talk about that meeting with Harry back in 1976, uh, to talk a bit about my reconstruction of the early history of the Mattachine Society and what it meant to me then, and why I understood it in the way that I did. Um, then I want to jump ahead about a decade and a half later, after that first meeting, uh, when in the 90s, when I first read Stuart Timmons' biography of Hay. Uh, it was a stretch of time between the 70s and the early 90s that included the AIDS epidemic and ACT UP, uh, two really massive marches on Washington, uh, and the really the explosion of gay issues onto the national political stage. Um, and then, in the last part, I want to jump ahead again um, and think about Harry Hay in the context of another centennial that we're in the midst of and that I've been involved in, and that is the centennial of Bayard Rustin, and how the experience of writing a biography of him and reflecting on his legacy continuously for much of this, of this year 
reflecting on it in these deeply conservative and reactionary political times has made me think yet again, uh, and in different ways, about earlier moments of queer radicalism. So, part one, encountering A. It's 1976. I'm in the midst of trying to research and write a history of pre-Stonewall gay and lesbian activism, uh, very much with the sense of trying to reclaim for activists in the 1970s, most of whom felt like we were inventing the whole thing, uh, a longer history of organized resistance. Uh, some of that earlier history was already out there. Uh, Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon had written some of it in Lesbian Woman. Uh, Kay Tobin and Randy Wicker, who is sitting right here in the front row, uh, did a series of activist profiles in The Gay Crusader. Um, Jonathan Ned Katz, who's somewhere out there, uh, had also at that point uh, shared with me the telephone interview he had done with Hay that was going to appear later in gay American history. So as I was going to, getting ready to meet Hay, I knew that as a fact, a long-term C-peer had come up with the idea for what became the Mattachine Society, and therefore we could credit our movement uh, with having been launched by a commie. Okay. Okay. So I spent the fall and the winter of 76 and 77 in California uh, interviewing activists from that earlier hom homophile generation. Uh, I did research in the offices of organizations that had kept their old records, uh, in the homes of activists who had saved boxes and boxes of old material for 20 years. Um, so I've been piecing together the history of the 50s and 60s, and I had some sense of where I was going with it. But I have to say, I was not prepared for the utter magic of encountering Hay and the nine or so hours of reminiscence that we recorded over a three-day visit. Now, part of the magic was simply the setting. Uh, you know, here I was, a Bronx kid, I barely had a driver's license. Uh, I'm driving an old Ford Falcon from LA um, with Jim Kepner, who's another activist of that generation, and for those who knew him, he was also quite a talker. <laughs> uh, we're traveling north from Santa Fe, uh, as I remember it, through like a sort of a dense forest along the edge of a gorge where the Rio Grande was flowing. Uh, I had never seen the Rio Grande, you know, climbing slowly, uh, and then suddenly emerging at the top of a plateau with this breathtaking panorama. Um, we make our way to San Juan Pueblo, uh, which was this totally idyllic environment to me. I mean, I had grown up in an apartment building in which there were more families than those who lived in the entire community that Hay was living in. And it was like I, was, I had been privileged to go to Wonderland. But the biggest part of the magic was Harry. Um, Harry was a storyteller. A lot of you have, of course, at least some of you have experienced that. Uh, it took us three hours of interviewing to get him to the age of 21. <laughs> <laughs> but who cared? I mean, he was mesmerizing. Uh, his stories about finding queer life in L.A. as a teenager in the late 20s and the early 30s, of making his way into the radical politics of the 1930s and the Communist Party, of participating in the San Francisco general strike, his years of community organizing. I mean, I hung on every word. There were, I mean, I sort of forgot that I was writing about the Mattachine Society. And in part because even in the 70s for a graduate student in history, there was a way that the Cold War had so suppressed the history of communist organizing in this country that Harry's stories to me had a vision and a vibrancy and a freshness that I fell in love with. But then, you know, after we got past the first, actually maybe five hours or six hours, there was this truth stranger than fiction story of how he brought the outsider political experience of a Marxist 
to the outsider social experience of being homosexual, and how he first imagined and then actually crafted, with the help of a few others, an organization whose goal was to liberate what he labeled as America's second largest minority. Uh, you know, in describing homosexuals as a social minority imprisoned within a dominant culture, Hay was challenging in 1951 a version of what later you could say people call heteronormativity uh, and what others might analyze as queer critiques of society and culture. It was just amazing. Okay. And here's how I describe the encounter with Hay and the rediscovery of this history while I was in the middle of it. This is a letter I wrote to my best friend from New Mexico. The interview with Hay is going very well, but the visit has become so much more. Hay is an inspiring human being, a man of real stature, with a breadth of vision, a depth of commitment, a brilliance and a warmth that I've rarely encountered. A few weeks later, I wrote, how profoundly and immeasurably you have affected my life. I wouldn't be the person I am, doing what I am doing, satisfied and thrilled with the quality of my life and joyfully looking toward the future, were it not for the incredibly important work which you and the rest of the Magnificent Seven did in founding the Mattachine Society. So why did I respond so intensely? Well, to me, positioned as I was in 1976, it was self-evident that it mattered. I was just old enough to have experienced gay male life in New York City pre-Stonewall, I had experienced the fear, the hiding, that sense of desperation, uh, that strange balancing of two different lives where by day I was a college student, hippie style, anti-war activist, and at night I roamed the parks and the streets and the toilets of Manhattan. Uh, when I think back to my first contacts with an organized gay movement, uh, toward the end of 1973, through new friends like Bert Hansen, who's here in the audience, uh, and then in early 1973, through the meetings that grew into the Gay Academic Union. When I think about that, I find myself wanting to use exactly the same language that Hay used with me in describing his encounter with mass protests in the 1930s. What he said then, and what I was feeling in the early 70s, you can't have been a part of that and not have your life completely changed. Mm -hmm. I think that was a reaction that describes very well the feelings of a lot of GLBT folks across several decades. The experience of participating for the first time in a movement type organization and having the parts of your life come together in this completely new way, uh, a way filled with all sorts of new hopes and possibilities, uh, with this combination of pride and joy and energy and commitment that you had never even imagined before. By 1976, after three years of immersion in collective gay activism, I was as excited and hopeful and energetic as ever, but as somebody who thought of himself as belonging to a vaguely defined, non-ideological left, I had also come to realize that the politics of what lots of us still refer to in 1976 as gay liberation was heading full force towards the mainstream. Uh, for instance, and I'm speaking here of myself, uh, the Gay Academic Union, which had seemed to be venturing into new frontiers in 1973, by 1976 to me seemed absorbed in arcane discussions of erudite trivia, had left <laughs> behind the politics of knowledge that some of us had been talking about. Um, or to give another example, in the summer of 1976, just before I headed off to California, 
Um, in New York, organizations like the National Gay Task Force and newspapers like The Advocate were trumpeting how wonderful it was that there were openly gay and lesbian delegates at the 1976 Democratic Convention in New York, mm. while some of us were spending our time organizing busloads of queers <laughs> to go to the counter-bicentennial march in Philadelphia. Okay. So, encountering <laughs> Harry Hay in New Mexico, as passionate and fierce as ever in 1976, telling me about the vision of the Mattachine Society, letting me realize that this historic moment had been plotted and conceived by a bunch of commies and fellow travelers. <laughs> well, suddenly, I, I was part of a tradition a tradition of organizing that had made a difference. And I and my little band of buddies in the Gay Socialist Action Project in New York, we were keeping that tradition alive. So, of course, I was thrilled and overwhelmed by my encounter with Hay, and I had no doubts about the enormous significance of what he had done. So let's now jump to 1993, 1994, my second encounter with Harry, and this time coming through reading Stuart Timmons' biography, The Trouble with Harry. A lot has happened in the intervening 18 years. Uh, in the biggest scheme of things, a lot of what had happened was really negative. Um, the impact of Reagan's election in 1980, for me, was almost immediate. Um, in the early 80s, my day jobs uh, involved preserving access to publicly funded child care and campaigning against prison expansion. And we were immediately confronted with cutbacks in one area and growth in the other. And I don't have to tell you which one was cutting back and which one was growing. Uh, and then there was AIDS. Uh, you know, a lot of people here can talk about this, the fears, the horrors, the ge geometrically expanding caseloads, the mortality statistics. And yet we also know, uh, retrospectively, that that wasn't the whole story of the AIDS epidemic. Um, uh, and I, 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 I teach a, a GLBT studies course that in my head I think of as Gay 101. Um, and in that course, um, I use a catchphrase to describe the 50s and 60s. I call it the, the worst time to be queer. And you know, I come back to that to remind them of, of things that we're studying. Well, when we study AIDS in the 1980s in that course, my line is to them, AIDS changes everything. Uh, AIDS provoked very quickly a queer mobilization on an unprecedented scale. Uh, organizations proliferated. Uh, many of them grew to a size that we hadn't before seen. Uh, paid workers, uh, paid staff, full-time workers uh, for gay and lesbian freedom became much more common. Uh, the gender separatism of the 70s, which many of us had experienced, gave way in a lot of cases to organizations and mobilizations that were much more co-gender than ever before. People of color GLBT organizations grew significantly in both size and number in the course of the 80s. And while many of them might have come into existence in order specifically to fight the AIDS epidemic, their work reached far beyond the epidemic to fighting against both homophobia and racism more generally. Um, the organizational impulse in the 1980s, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute, also spread to geographic areas that hadn't seen much queer organization before. Uh, activists, various activists, also found themselves able to press successfully against the door of policymakers from local government to national government. Um, and there was also the revival of militant and often multi-issue direct action politics through organizations like ACT UP. It was astounding 
this level of organizing if you had experienced the 70s, even though the 70s were pretty thrilling. And the way I would sort of dramatize it is to just the difference between the 1979 March on Washington and the 1987 March on Washington. Mm -hmm. The 1979 March on Washington, again, I'm speaking for myself, it was great fun if you were there. It was invigorating for those of us who went. But it was piddling in size by the standards of what a march on Washington was supposed to be, right? The 1987 march on Washington, after just six years of AIDS, it was gargantuan in size. It dwarfed the 1963 march on Washington. It was bigger than the anti-war marches I had been on in the 1960s. And amazingly, uh, for some of us who had experienced a sense of isolation often in gay liberation, it was really a coalition affair. I mean, activists like Jesse Jackson and Cesar Chavez and Eleanor Sneal speaking at the, at the rally. Uh, and that even was small potatoes in comparison to the size of the 1993 march. Uh, and if you go back to news, mainstream newspaper accounts of 1993, they describe the events of the spring of 1993, the combination of the march and the debates over the military policy. They actually talk about the gay moment, you know. <laughs> uh, so uh, there was a lot of change. Um, for me, I experienced it in close up, but in a very particular way. I, I had moved to the Piedmont of North Carolina in 1983. Um, when I got there, I was one of the only people in my set of com you know, communities, Greensboro, Winston-Salem, High Point, I was one of the only people who was out of the closet in public about being gay. Uh, there were gay and lesbian organizations, but to me, who had just published sexual politics, sexual communities, they actually looked like the homophile organizations of the 50s, because very few people used their names or would ever be quoted or publicly photographed. Um, by the end of the 80s, the change was dramatic in North Carolina. There was a network of AIDS organizations around the state. In a lot of towns and cities, there were public hearings before human rights commissions and city councils. There started being annual pride marches. I found myself in North Carolina as a way of staying connected uh, to broader activist networks, uh, getting more involved with what was now the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, uh, which I looked so askance at in the mid-1970s. Um, by the late 1980s, it seemed to me to be a different organization, and I don't know if it was different or I was different, but it seemed different. Um, it was a national organization whose staff had primarily been community organizers who didn't believe in top-down centralized leadership but had a strong commitment to fostering grassroots activism. Uh, and in their campus organizing, their uh, family project, their commitment to building independent statewide coalitions that they had no control over, um, it just all seemed very impressive to me. Now, this would be a group that could easily do it. Um, we can debate forever whether the changes that AIDS and the 80s brought should be described as this, this, or that. <laughs> um, not utopia, not inclusive, not radical, um, but still, it was change on a scale never before seen, and change that occurred because of the activism and initiative of masses of people. It wasn't change that happened through the gifts of the gods coming down to us. So it's around this time, and I can't remember if it was in 93 or 94, my notes don't have a date on them, uh, but it was around this time that I read Stuart Timmons' biography of Hay, The Tr Trouble of Hair. Uh, it's a thoroughly absorbing read. Uh, if you haven't read it, read it. It's a good biography that tells stories. Uh, I ate up every detail of it. Uh, where my focus in interviewing Harry had been the story of the early Mattachine, Timmons is doing a full-scale biography. 
Uh, it's rich with amazing stories. I remember reading it and thinking, Harry knew everybody in Los Angeles that ever became famous. How, how did that happen? How did he just cross paths with them all? Um, it gives you a feel for what it was like to be young and in the meaning of the term then, coming out in the 20s and early 30s. Uh, the biography also captures a very good sense of the on-the-ground daily life of the CP member in those years. And it also captures Hay's intellectual curiosity and the breadth of his interests. I mean, it's really fair to say that Harry was a self-trained and self-taught intellectual. Yet, from the vantage point of 1998, just 18 years after I had interviewed Hay, I found myself much less awed and impressed than I was in 1976 when Hay told me his story and I was uncovering the story of the early Mattachine. First of all, I was really struck by, and you know, because of my background, really put off by his class privilege. I mean, his father made $50,000 in 1914. My father never got close to $50,000, and he worked until the 1980s. Um, it's just interesting to me. But then, related to that privilege, perhaps, uh, Timmons, and Timmons loves Harry. There's no question about that. Harry also comes across as quite the bully, with a strong authoritarian streak in him, uh, that I also have to say I associate often with class privilege. Uh, he often brooks no disagreement and spreads contentiousness wherever he goes. Um, <laughs> Timmons uh, devotes a lot of space to Harry's post manachine life, I think almost half of the biography. Um, and after the counter-revolution in the Mattachine, eventually Harry did return many years later to a commitment to building queer communities and solidarity. But, from my point of view in 1994, the claims that Harry made for this, uh, a genetic mutation of consciousness, and the form that it took, radical theory retreats, seemed to me, where I was positioned, completely remote from the concrete organizing needs of the early 90s. But most of all, when I look back at the experience of Harry and the early Mattachine Society in, 19, in the 1990s, at that distance in time, I saw a radical vision and an activist impulse that left almost no traces, and a radical visionary and activist who, in fact, gave it all away, who dropped out when the going got tough, who lacked a stick to itness. It became much harder for me in 1994 to convince myself that the early Mattachine Society mattered for as much as I thought it had mattered, and to see it as anything more than a queer little piece of history. I was glad that I had learned about A. I was glad that I had encountered him and written about him, but that was then and this was now, and the hay and the early Mattachine no longer seemed relevant to me to the life and death struggles of the AIDS era. And I'm actually not sure that if I were discovering Hay for the first time in the 90s, and of course, I can't ever know this, uh, but I'm not sure that he would have appealed enough to me then to make me want to recover his story. Okay, so hold on to those bubbling concerns uh, <laughs> and those sacrilegious and scandalous reservations about and founding hero. <laughs> Let's jump ahead again, another 18 years. It's so interesting what happens in 18 year gaps. Uh, another 18 years to 2012. Uh, if I thought that the Reagan years represented an apotheosis of right wing politics, 
you know, my political judgment is really bad. I was wrong. Uh, a stolen presidential election in 2000, the politics that the 9-11 attacks enabled, uh, have produced a country more politically reactionary than I ever imagined I would see. And I have a very vivid imagination. <laughs> uh, you know, by 2012, the Reagan years almost seemed promising. Um, in terms of my own trajectory in those 18 years, um, I have become a professor at a research university with a generous salary, a secure job with benefits uh, in the midst of this great recession. I spend lots of time in committee meetings that never needed to happen. <laughs> I review job applications by the hundreds and have to reject most of them because there are almost no jobs. Uh, I write letters of recommendation. I read seminar papers, dissertations, manuscript drafts. Uh, in the words of the community organizer who mentored me in the 1970s, I seem to have slipped over the edge into the abyss of professionalism. <laughs> now, to be fair to myself, at least a little bit, I also was a member in the last two or three years, say, of the organizing team that conducted the first successful union organizing drive among faculty in a research university in almost two decades. <laughs> I'll probably be retired before a contract is negotiated. But, um, I also um, actually get enormous joy and satisfaction still out of my experience in undergraduate classrooms. Uh, I feel like I could teach my queer courses forever, uh, and I will always be excited by watching their excitement and surprise and outrage uh, at learning things that no one had ever told them before and then watching how they take what they learn into the world. Uh, I, I act as a cheerleading squad uh, for those students who throw themselves into contemporary efforts like the Occupy movement or especially on my campus, Justice for Undocumented Immigrants. Um, but I have to say, I'm also, even with this, I'm also struck by how, for the vast majority of my undergraduates today, the mass mobilizations of the 1960s, or even against AIDS in the 1980s, seem unimaginable to them today, even as they yearn for something like that. Now, over this last year, and I mentioned that about the 1960s, because over this last year, I have had reason to think more about the 60s because of another centennial that is happening, uh, the centennial of Bayard Rustin's birth. The wonderful Mandy Carter, if any of you know her, uh, has spurred a year's worth of events around the country to create visibility for Rustin's life and legacy and to make space for thinking about what his story can teach us. Uh, and because I've written a biography of Rustin, I've had the privilege of participating in many of those events. And you know, a week doesn't go by where I don't think about Bayard Rustin. Now, Rustin's life and Harry's life have some interesting parallels beyond the year of their birth. Both of them joined the communist movement in the 1930s. Sexuality profoundly affected the course of their lives. Uh, it created incredible conflict and tension in their public lives. Uh, in Hayes' case, as we know, and uh, Bettina did a really good job of talking about this, in Hayes' case with the Communist Party, um, in Rustin's case with the peace movement and the black freedom struggle. 1953 was a disastrous year for both of them. Uh, Hay lost his beloved Mattachine Society and you know, felt like he had no mooring in the world. Uh, Rustin's arrest on a public sex charge in Los Angeles, where there was the Mattachine counter-revolution. Uh, his arrest on a public sex charge ruptured many of his closest activist relationships and brought him public shame. <laughs> 
Um, there were also interesting contrasts. Um, gay obviously became Harry's obsession, um, whereas for Rustin, it was, it was never really a focus of his political activism. He did a little bit of speaking about it towards the end of his life. Uh, but, now at me again, where Hay's life stopped being an object of political fascination for me, Rustin's life still seems to offer no end of material to think about. And I sometimes think, and it's actually it's the only book that I've ever written where when the book is over and you send it off to the publisher, there's such relief, you want to hold it in your hands, but you never want to have anything to do with it again. <laughs> Whereas with the Rustin biography, I mean, I, I feel like I could give Rustin talks forever and never exhaust it. All right. Um, but really, it's, I think um, what keeps me engaged with Rustin in a way that I feel less engaged with Harry's legacy is that no matter what kind of setbacks and obstacles and reversals Rustin encountered, he never withdrew from the fray. From the moment in the 1930s when he tr thrust himself into radical political activism to his death half a century, half a century later, Rustin's life is the model of stick to itness. Uh, his commitment to justice was unwavering. No matter what bad things happen to him, and bad things happen to him, he never goes home to tend his own garden or lick his own wounds. He was a model of multi-issue organizing, of coalition and intersectionality before progressives started talking about this all the time. Um, at any moment in any political campaign, he might prioritize one issue over another. Racial justice was often at the top of the list, but at other times it's nuclear weapons or European colonialism or the rights of workers to organize into unions or of refugees displaced by civil war. But he lived by the philosophy that justice was a universal concept Justice was indivisible, and he wasn't going to accept a notion of people as essentially different from one another. I think most of all, and especially now in 2012, what fascinates me and attracts me to Rustin was his decision as a radical activist, somebody who always thought of himself as of the left, to grapple with issues of power. He had spent years, decades, in the peace movement, which had this commitment to, you know, bearing witness and being the lone voice in the wilderness, if that <laughs> was possible. Uh, and sometimes Rustin realized, well, that's the best you can do. You can bear witness and be the lone voice in the wilderness. But he also wanted to know, what's the plan for going beyond that? How does peace become something other than a utopian dream. And in the 1960s, I mean, you can read it in some of his correspondence and his speeches, Rustin vibrated with excitement as the civil rights struggle of African Americans mobilized more and more and more people until every day saw more protests around the country than you could keep count of. He remembered in those times, how the protests that he came of age with in the 1930s were suppressed and marginalized because of wars and cold wars and political repression. And Rustin wondered whether that was going to happen again in the 1960s uh, or if a different outcome was possible. And so at the height of the civil rights struggle, Rustin proposes the need to, pro to move uh, and this is the phrase he used, the need to move from protest to politics, to figure out, it was his call to the left, to figure out how not to remain stuck in the stance of outsider, of dissenter, of difference, but instead to engage the political system so that those who stand for radical ideals of justice and who make the rules, 
and who write the playbook and who implement policy and who defend what the system is will actually be the us who wants change. This idea uh, didn't go over well with his radical comrades who runs it. It was rejected by those on the left, but it became the strategy of radicals on the right. Mm -hmm. uh, and they did really well with it. Uh, and created the nightmare world that we live in today. All right, so in thinking about Rustin's centennial year and about his challenge to the left to notice and abandon its unadmitted commitment to marginality, as he would have put it. It's also made me think in the centennial of Harry Hay about the shape and direction of radical queer mobilization in the past. Um, there's the radical and visionary origins of the Mashing Society that Hay was responsible for, but that also proved very evanescent. There's the radical energy unleashed by Stonewall and gay liberation. I mean, read those manifestos that were produced more than 40 years ago, and you see queers envisioning a remade world without oppression. Um, but then when you look more closely at that radical activism, it also is amazing how quickly, in some ways, it dissipated and how the organizational manifestations of it shattered. Um, I, I read uh, the oral history of, of one GLF member, whom I'm not actually going to name, uh, who uh, talked about uh, the gay, his gay liberation front, and he, he uses the phrase and the excitement of talking about it many years later, we made a revolution. And then you read further on and you realize he was a member of the gay liberation front for seven months and then left it and went on to other things. And it's like, how do you make a revolution? It's like your, to use a phrase that Harry used and that meant so much to me, your life was completely changed but that isn't the whole story. Uh, or, you know, uh, to be really sacrilegious, um, that other moment of awesome and inspiring activism at the end of the 80s and early 90s when ACT UP militants changed a lot. Uh, it was a transforming experience for almost everyone involved. I mean, read um, the website, the, the ACT UP, I am forgetting the exact name of it, but the ACT UP oral history website that Sarah Schulman and Avram, I think, put, have put Jim together. Hubbard. Jim oh, Hubbard. Jim, oh, Jim Hubbard, okay. Uh, it's those, those sites, it's, I mean, those stories, I could read those oral histories forever. Um, and then, you know, I also, it, you know, part of me looks in puzzlement as this military militancy shifts to kiss-ins at suburban shopping malls. Um, okay, so where is this taking me? Um, Am I suggesting that Harry Hay and his legacy be dumped? Um, or that we shake our heads in disappointment and dismay at the incompleteness of previous manifestations of queer radicalism? Uh, do we need another hero, as in someone else and something else instead? Or am I asking or suggesting or trying to figure out for myself that as we use moments like this to recall and celebrate the centennial of figures like Hay or figures like Rustin, that we also use those moments not just to celebrate but to engage in critical reflection. Critical reflection not only of the work of those of us who come before us, but also critical self-reflection of our own trajectories as participants in struggles for justice, no matter what stage in our life we find ourselves. So, do we need another hero? Yes, we do. Um, but not in the sense of a different one, get rid of them, but in the sense of another and another and another and another, so that every single one of us becomes a hero of history. Um, and I don't mean that as, as sort of e exaggeration or hyperbole. Um, in my best dream of our activist futures, 
I'd like to re revise slightly that statement of, hey, you couldn't have been a part of that and not have your life completely changed, and instead find each of us in our own way reminiscing someday. You couldn't have been a part of that and not have the world completely changed. Thank you.